Hello, this is Kurt Frankum, and many of you know me as the host of the Leading Saints podcast. But Leading Saints isn't just a podcast. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we strive to create quality leadership content for Latter-day Saints in order to help them be better prepared to lead. With this mission comes a lot of expense, and we need additional help to continue our efforts in the coming year. In order to exchange value for value, we have created the Core Leader Community. To become a core leader, all you have to do is become a subscribing donor, which might be a monthly recurring donation or even a quarterly or yearly donation. For those who become a core leader through a subscription donation, you have access to our core leader library, which includes additional recorded interviews not available to the general audience, access to all virtual summits, discounts on products and conferences, and access to a private core cast feed where you will hear additional leadership thought and behind the scenes happenings. We are a community of leaders making this happen, and we need you a part of this mission. Text the word LEAD to 474747 in order to become a core leader today, or visit leadingsaints.org slash donate. Another week of the Leading Saints podcast. My name is Kurt Frankum, your host, and I welcome you, especially those that are brand spanking new. Thank you for subscribing to this podcast. At least if you haven't, you should hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any future episodes of the Leading Saints podcast. And uh, basically what this is, is we help Latter-day Saints be better prepared to lead. That's our mission uh, as a 501c3 nonprofit, as you probably just heard at the bumper at the beginning. But we help Latter-day Saints be better prepared to lead. We do that through producing this podcast. We do that through producing or uh, having people submit articles that you can be found at leadingsaints.org. We do that through the newsletter that you can get every week that uh, has unique content that is found nowhere else but on the newsletter. You can get that at leadingsaints.org slash subscribe. We do that mission through uh, virtual summits and online conferences that we produce, and we're starting to do more live events. And so all these things we do Put together, our hope is that you're walking away from this better prepared to lead. And this episode, (laughs) okay, all right, let me just deep breath here. This one was so good. Now, I realize from time to time there are episodes that probably I, as the host, am the only person in the world who actually thinks it's phenomenal. Okay, I get it. But I think this episode is phenomenal. And I hope that you listen to it, re-listen to it, and uh, take notes. It is with the one and only Tony Overbay, who is the host and creator of the, of another podcast called The Virtual Couch. Now, The Virtual Couch is a podcast much like this one, except the host actually has credentials. <laughs> no, uh, Tony is a, a therapist. He's actually a, on our board of advisors with Leading Saints, and he is definitely a well-known, demanded therapist that is doing phenomenal work. Definitely subscribe to his podcast at uh, The Virtual Couch. You will enjoy it, and he's got a lot of episodes to jump into and uh, on various topics, everything that a therapist may encounter and and deal with that are so helpful. But we talk about this concept of codependency. Now, you may be thinking, Kurt, what on earth is codependency? Or the only people who are familiar with codependency are those who have had a loved one go through an addiction. But codependency is actually something that is quite prevalent, in my opinion, is a pretty major issue in our religious culture, okay? And in this episode, I explain why I think that. Another way to label codependency is the nice guy syndrome. The nice guy syndrome is uh, something I struggle with day to day, week to week. I am a recovering nice guy. It is very difficult. And the nice guy syndrome is quite prevalent in religious communities. And uh, we'll get into that and talk about it. But really the points and the aha moments that I had, and you'll hear them throughout this, I just have, it just clicks for me. And I'm, I just, it's so good. And it's helped me. I've thought about this episode every day since we recorded it, and I'm still thinking about it. So you're going to enjoy it. Here is my interview with Tony Overbay, the host of The Virtual Couch. This is an epic moment. Tony Overbay is in my presence. I am in your studio, Kurt. In, in my studio, which is just another bedroom in my house. I but. didn't know that. It looks really good, though. It looks like a real studio, especially when you're doing things on the air. 
Yeah, well, I, I'll take all the stuff down and gotcha. and turn it back. And you have <laughs> snacks, you have oh, yeah. uh, Kleenex, everything. Yeah, I, so I've had a few episodes where like the person, you know, it's, we're talking about something emotional. And, right. and the person's, you know, snorting over there. There's a snot coming. I'm like, oh, I wish I <laughs> So I thought I got to get a box of Kleenexes for this place. So there That's it is. Well done. I have run out of Kleenexes as a therapist in my office and there is nothing worse oh. than going in and grabbing some paper towels out of the restroom and saying, here you go on your yeah. delicate face. So right. yeah, so I'm, I'm grateful You're to see you have those. Got this out of our public restroom. Exactly. Right. So Curtis <laughs> nice. prepared. So uh, you've been on the podcast before. You're one of our, uh, you're on our board of advisors and uh, you, you do some great stuff. Maybe just if somebody's not heard of you, which is, I mean, come on, Tony. No, but if someone hasn't heard of you, put yourself in the context. This is so hard. This is. Um, I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. I host a podcast called The Virtual Couch. And you and I did a podcast on leading saints that was that was one of my, I don't know, it was uh, it was climb Mount Everest kind of moment. That, uh-huh. was a, that was a very big moment. It was one where I was scared to death. You were a pro's pro and in, in interviewing me. But I also have an online pornography recovery program called The Path Back. And I actually just have my first book that came out five, six weeks ago. Oh, cool. um, it's called, I mean, it's not a, it doesn't, I mean, I'm making a joke. It, it's so good because it helps so many people, <laughs> but it's called He's a Porn Addict Now What? An Expert and a Former Addict to Answer Your Questions. Oh, awesome. Yeah. And it's, and it's been the number one bestseller in sexual health and recovery on Amazon for a few weeks now because it's really unique. It's one where the person, Joshua Shea, my co-author, has another book out about his pornography addiction. He was a politician, um, ran a film festival and a magazine in the East Coast, and then and then was uh, arrested for pornography, pornography addiction, and actually even served jail time, wrote a, wrote a book about it. And then he went on about 70 or 80 podcasts and apparently felt he like he connected on mine. Oh, really? And then, wow. yeah, and then he presented me with this book project. And so we basically took about 80 to 100 questions on sex addiction, compulsive sexual behavior, pornography addiction, betrayal trauma. And then we were asked them and I didn't know what he wrote and he didn't know what I wrote. And it, and it was just, it was pretty incredible to then see how those answers work together. So that's what that book's about. Huh. And uh, yeah, it just came check out. It out. Yeah, well, it just came out on Kindle too. And, and oh, which cool. is good because it is, here's the part where I was kind of joking about, I am so proud and not in a, unri- a righteous killed the Nephites way about the book. <laughs> And the critical reviews have been just, it's been mind blowing about That's just, awesome. yeah. So it's really been, uh, it's been neat, but it's not one that people want out on their coffee, coffee table. table. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. So the Kindle version has been selling really well, awesome. but yeah, so a book online program, the podcast, and then a, a therapist, um, four kids that are amazing. Been married to my high one school in sweetheart at, at basketball. Yeah, I know. Right. It's so fun. I don't want to be that guy, that proud dad guy, but, and it is my mission to recruit him to BYU somehow, but I do it's hear probably this not going to happen. I do right? hear this often. Yeah, we do. No, but he's a, yeah, he's a sophomore, but he's actually, um, he's uh, got a national ranking in Crazy. basketball. And I love I seeing know, your clips come up on Facebook because I'm just like, man, that kid is. When you and I finally got to bro hug when I came in here, I don't know if you noticed, I'm not a very tall man. <laughs> but we're about the same size. Okay, right? right? And, but my son has has grown to a. Is he taller age. than you? Oh, gosh, yeah. He's like oh, six good. one or something. Oh, wow. and, yeah, it's really fun. Yeah. I was, never quite broke that six foot mark. Oh, I'm that. well below the six yeah. foot mark, Kurt. Oh, well. But yeah, so that's a, you can find me at TonyOverbay.com and all that kind of awesome. stuff. Yeah. Perfect. So I just loved talking with you and hearing that you came to town. I thought we got to do something in person yeah. and different topics of are, are always on my mind. And one topic I want to dive into, and especially while you're here, because I think it'll be a great discussion to have in person is uh, about codependency. Yeah. And most people hear this term, they're like, oh, what? And, and in my opinion, and this is going to hopefully get your attention. But in my opinion, in our culture, our Latter-day Saint culture, this is the biggest and most invisible problem mm. that that we deal with. And I think it's it's one that is very common in, in a lot of religious, orthodox religious sure. uh, cultures, communities, right? And uh, I'll, I'll, we'll d- dive into this as far as why that is. But just for me coming to you as a therapist and I yeah. say, hey, I heard this thing about codependency. What on earth is codependency? How would you answer that? Well, that's why I loved your question because I've been doing this for about 15 years and I feel like even when I started, actually one of the first books I ever bought was one called Codependent No More by an author named Melody Beatty and that was the codependent Bible. And I, and I read it and at the time I felt like codependency was the big topic or you know, kind of the diagnosis. Everybody was codependent. And so codependent by definition is excessive emotional or psychological reliance on a partner. And I think we often think about codependence with regard to an an addiction, right? And that's the one I get often. And somebody who is, they're they're kind of not laying down the law. They're not putting up boundaries. You know, a lot of, when you're doing a lot of work with codependence, you're, you're trying to help them establish boundaries because the codependent person doesn't want to really be mean to the person that's struggling with the addiction. And so it somewhat could be viewed as enabling the, the addict, that sort uh-huh. of thing. 
But what I would talk a lot about, especially over the last few years, is more of the example of codependency being it's how they view their self-worth. So it's, it's codependent people need external sources or things or other people to give them feelings of self-worth. And so a lot of times that does follow. It's been if they've grown up with maybe destructive parental relationships or an abusive past or if they've had self-destructive partners that codependents learn to react to other people and, yep. and they worry or they get a lot of their self-worth off of how other people react. And so we can even see that in our church culture. And I see it a lot, especially with moms, bless their heart for all the work they're doing, yeah. where they pour so much into their value of how their husband might be doing or how their kids are doing or how, they, how they're doing in their calling. And instead of kind of bringing up that inner wealth, it's more about how, how's everybody reacting to what I'm going through. Right. And I think a lot of it, I, I use the, when you talk about moms, it goes to the, the Eagle Scout phenomenon a little bit, or the merit oh. badges. Like the, the joke is like, oh, you got your Eagle Scout. Well, your mom really earned your Eagle Scout because she, you know, pushed every merit badge on you and every, yeah. every bit of progress. And in the addiction context, I think a lot of people would recognize it, that this is where it gets like so inflamed, the codependency that's, it's hard to miss where maybe a husband is, is caught viewing porn yeah. and the, the wife is like, listen, you, you're going to the bishop, yeah. you're going to go see therapy, you're going to get fixed. And then he's like, okay, you know, I'm sorry, I'll do that. Right. And then it becomes like, hey, you were supposed to read that chapter before your next appointment. Let's sit down right now. Yeah. We're going to read this chapter together. And it's completely understandable yeah. because man, it, you're as the, the wife or the, the spouse is thinking, this is not according to our values and we're going to yes. fix this. We're yeah. going to fix you yeah. together. And if, even if I have to drag you to every point, right? And obviously that is not a healthy no. state of mind for a spouse to be there, right? And so as a therapist, I imagine that when you are helping an addict, you're also helping the spouse or they often say the spouse has their own recovery. They do. You know, no, because that, of that codependency. It's, so, it's interesting you bring that up. So I did almost a decade's worth of just primarily working with the addict. So the pornography addict, compulsive sexual behavior. And when you're working with a pornography addict, and this is what I loved about the first episode that, that we did together mm -hmm. is, you know, I kind of shared with you that I feel like the addicts that I would see come into my office were typically, I call them, there's voids. I mean, they didn't feel connected in their parenting or in their marriage and their faith and their health and their career. And so then throw some early exposure to pornography in there and compulsive sexual behavior, throw the dopamine rush of, you know, things like orgasm, that sort of thing. And now mm -hmm. you've got this just toxic mix of when somebody feels not connected in this whatever part of their life, then they turn to that addiction. And so I'm working with a partner or, or the addict to really fill in those voids in their life and, and try to, you know, giving them tools to become a better husband, to become a better parent, to navigate their faith, to find their career, to really dial in their health. And the hard part can be that can help them. But at times that might not be what their partner is expressing to them or what their, their partner is going through a completely different thing. So then I did a couple of years of betrayal trauma recovery training. And you're right. It was a completely different ballgame. And it helped me. I felt like as a therapist, understand what the betrayed is what we like to call the, but what the betrayed is going through. But it really is a bit. It's a different experience than what the addict is going through. And that right. is quite a balance to try to weave those two together. Yeah. And you can't just fix the spouse by fixing the one that's no. the, ad, the addict. No. Right. right. And it makes me think of, it goes back to the, you know, the void. And oftentimes yeah. that void is caused by trauma. So yes. it may be, maybe had a really rough upbringing. Yes. I think you've mentioned this a few times. You grew up with alcoholic parents, yeah. right? And, and so that can then turn you into, I'm, I, I hated that. I'm going to be a very good dad, yeah. right? Which is a. But that, it was funny. Yeah, I was sharing with you before we even started. I mean, I wanted to be a husband and a father, I think, before I even had an idea of what that really meant. I mean, right. I, I wanted to be the world's greatest husband and father, just, you know. That was just a, a, a just deep value of mine. Right. And, and I don't know if that's a normal thought that 14 and 15 year old boys have. Right. You know? yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, that thought, that value can seem, I mean, it's a good thought and a good yeah. value, but what you're doing in that, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, is you're, you're, there's a void, yes. there's trauma that you're trying to mask. bury yes. and mask yeah. through this. Right? And, and for mine, it turned into, and I didn't realize this till quite a bit later, but I did a whole lot of speaking early on after I joined the church in my 20s and 30s. And I mean, I would speak anywhere. I, I wanted to just get everybody excited, but I know that I was really, I mean, I was kind of had this little codependent relationship. I was like, mm -hmm. you guys like me? Am I good? You know, is uh -huh. this, is this good? And I, and I taught seminary for seven years, the seniors. And, and I loved that because it really was, it was almost like every morning I was going there and I was, I was probably getting a little bit of that validation, but yet I felt like I was doing it from a good place of trying to help yeah. these, these students. Right. And that's where I, I, the emphasis I want to make in this episode is that 
when we talk about codependency, it's easy to talk about codependency of like, well, here's some signs you may see as a bishop when that person walks into your office, they may right. be experiencing codependency. I don't want this episode to be about anybody else but the leader, yeah. right? So we're talking to the to leader, you, in this. not necessarily <laughs> the husband of an addict, the yeah. wife of an addict. I mean, because those, when trauma is obvious yeah. and the, the wound is gaping and oozing and gross, like it's, it's obvious to see the codependency, but it's sometimes more difficult to see the codependency in our own lives as, you know, like myself, I didn't have a traumatic childhood. Mm. You know, I, I can't think of any gaping wound per se, but I, I recognize a lot of codependency and how it really limits us from a richer experience, especially in leadership. So that's where I'm yes. at. So I want listeners to understand that we are talking about you. And if you think oh, I'm fine, you know, I don't, I'm not codependent. Let's right. just listen to us for a minute and yeah, see where, where exactly. we can go. So let me paint a picture context of this. And, and uh, I did a an interview with Robert Glover, who wrote the book, No More Mr. Nice Guy. And we hear this concept, the nice guy syndrome. This is something I struggle with a lot. And when, when anybody says I struggle with the nice guy syndrome, they're saying I struggle with codependency. Okay. And again, you can correct me if I'm, I'm stepping out of bounds anywhere here. But so for example, when I got called as a bishop at 28, there was my, my codependency, it it flamed up. My nice guy flamed up a little bit because, yeah. or became inflamed because I thought, Oh yeah, of course. I mean, yeah, not everybody gets this chance, but it's obvious. I mean, I've jumped through the hoops. I yeah. mean, I'm a really good guy. Yeah. And, you know, of course they selected me. Again, I'm not articulating these, even these thoughts in my mind, but right. that's sort of what the adversary sort of leverages. Like, you're just such a nice guy. And so we begin to identify with, I'm the person that's always smiling and I'm yeah. shaking everybody's yes. hand and I'm right. And we want to be that Bishop. That, that, and how often do you want it all the time? I mean, was it 24 seven? Did you feel like you needed to be that Bishop? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Even at home, right? Even yeah. the moments I'd snap at my kids and I think, <clears throat> all right, a Bishop doesn't do that, yeah. you know, like, and so it's this constant struggle with your identity and mm. that's where it gets back to where shame comes in. We'll take it through the, this model as far as how that goes. But when that shame begins to come in, then I want to just want to cover up and overcompensate with more nice guy, right? Yeah. Like, okay, well, I just need to, I just need, need to go do my ministering assignment. This and that's that's my problem. If I just do that, the, the try hard gospel. So, yeah. take us down this path as far as like I'm setting the context yeah. of maybe just an example of where you see it, or maybe someone in the ward is sick, and so you feel like I, I got to get over there and deliver three casseroles this week because if I don't, man, that's not according to my values. Right. So, if I don't, then then people are going to think that I'm a bad bishop or people right. are going to talk about me or people are going to think that I must be doing other things wrong. Or, yeah. I mean, you can kind of go all kinds of places in your yeah. mind, right? Right, right. Yeah. yeah. So well, are you okay if we take a step back? Yeah, so here's where, and I like that you've already talked to, tapped into this concept of your individual values. So mm-hmm. one of the things that I like to do when somebody comes in to deal with any, whether it's anxiety, depression, addiction, anything in my office is I start with you're okay. And I know that sounds like a cliche and those sort of things, but I am a huge fan of a therapy modality called acceptance and commitment therapy. We'll call it ACT from this moment forward. Okay. And ACT, I actually learned about ACT when I was working for the church as a therapist and they sent me to a training and I had always been a cognitive behavioral therapy therapist, a CBT therapist. And I don't know if we want to kind of talk, you want I, me to give I, a I brief overview? Hand, yeah. Uh, would be just sort of that my thoughts, thoughts lead to emotions, lead to emotions. emotions to behaviors. Yeah, that's right. And so, and it's been around for a long time. And in a nutshell, it, it kind of addresses this, you know, Hey, let's just kind of look at those thoughts you're having maybe come from your past. Yeah. They're, they're most likely automatic negative thoughts. They have little cool acronyms Ant, automatic negative thought, uh-huh. or they call it the stinking thinking. And so again, it, this is such and, a brief and, overview, but yeah. Yeah. I and mean, we're not, we're, as we talk about these things, we're not throwing one of the above. They're no, just different no, no, modalities. Different. Right? And so, so CBT just says, so then look at, you get into a situation, you kind of feel bad about something and you kind of say, oh, I'm probably having automatic negative thoughts. And so the goal in CBT is to change that thought. Maybe mm-hmm. some, it's maybe some other, maybe I'm interpreting this wrong and it's something else. But I have to tell you, when I w- went to this acceptance and commitment therapy training, this ACT training, I honestly felt like, wow, this is what I changed careers at 30 to learn about. Because what ACT says is, we're kind of starting from this, hey, you're the only person that has ever walked the earth that has had all of your, they call them private experiences, your nature and nurture and birth order and DNA and abandonment and rejection and fear and hopes and loss. And you're it, like you're the only person. So actually, what if the feelings you have, whether it's not wanting to deliver the casserole right away or having a feeling of it's, it's hard for me to go to the hospital when I don't know what to do. 
you know, what if you start by saying, Hey, yeah, you have those thoughts and feelings because you're human Uh and you're the only person that's ever been through the stuff that you bring to the table. And I even go so far as to say, as a matter of fact, if you didn't feel that way, something would be wrong with you. Mm. You know, now you're kind of in this world of, and this is maybe not the right, uh, context but i always jokingly now say if you didn't have those feelings you're a robot or a psychopath and you're neither one (laughs) so you start from that that world of acceptance is saying i'm okay yeah right and and this goes back so uh, just to put in the context with maybe a typical leadership in which you've done a little bit but you know maybe things seem to be falling apart in the ward and you think man i thought i was a better bishop than this and oh i can i can identify five areas where i really slipped up and yeah and to get to a point where you're just saying I'm okay. Yeah. Like that is okay. Yes. This stuff happens and you sort of get in the state of mind of, of acceptance. Yes. Right. And this is a lot of, I've done, been doing a lot of speaking and uh, I've done a few episodes about this concept of God is not disappointed in nope, you. Nope. Right? Absolutely not. And no. because, and people sort of look at that like, huh, I like, know. I don't know about that. But if we can get in the state of mind where we say, you know what, I've done these things. I've fallen short. I haven't lived up to the, be the bishop I thought I would be or the relief side of president I thought it would be. Is God disappointed in me? No. Hmm. In fact, oh, he's not like, okay, then I'm okay. Th- this is okay. We can move forward, right? Th- I it's see me so shift in my chair. Like, it is very liberating. And I mean, as a matter of fact, the acceptance and commitment therapy book I love that just came out by the founder of it, who is still alive, Dr. Stephen Hayes, it's called A Liberated Mind. Because again, we're kind of starting with this principle of you think those things because you are a human, which is a wonderful place to start. And I don't know, and this might be the part where I think I joked with you earlier, if you want to edit anything, Kurt, <laughs> okay. this might be one of those where I will go off in the weeds. I'll keep you in, in, in right? line. In the but lane but even if you are to start to take on more or start to expand your horizons, that is going to come more effectively from a place of acceptance rather than a place of what's wrong with me. So I think people often feel like, what, man, what, I, I really need to, I got to figure things out. Like, what's wrong with me? I'm, I'm not doing this well, or I'm a horrible bishop, or I'm not as compassionate. Guess what? That is not going to, that is not the path to now I'm going to be super compassionate. Now I'm going to be awesome. Right. Because, because you're just starting with this negative view of self yeah. versus and, that if I'm okay, then it's like, all right, I'm okay. Right. Now what can I do to grow? Yeah. Cause a lot of people, they hear this concept of is, can God be disappointed in you? I say no. And then they think, well, if he's not like, won't we just like sin then? Or like, exactly, won't we just lose right? control? No, like, you won't. Right. Or, or if I say that I'm okay being this type of a bishop, maybe that'll mean I'll just perpetuate down this, this negative slope and be a worse and worse bishop. But no, that's not the case. No, we, no. we can say we're okay. Yes. And that we still have a, a, a uh, we're still aiming for progress. And here's the right? one I want to say, you know, trust me, I'm a therapist. I don't know. I feel like that should be on a t-shirt maybe, but, <laughs> but that, that is the part where you nailed it. When people say, okay, but if I say I'm, I'm okay, then I will never try to grow yeah. or do anything again. And yeah. that is the, that is absolutely incorrect. That is, right. yeah, it's false. Right. Because when I'm in a state of God, God is not disappointed in me. In fact, he is overwhelmingly in love with me. Like I, there's nothing more I want to do than absolutely. keep trying. Yes. Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, another tangent you might be able to cut out, but I spoke <laughs> at a body positive conference just about two or three weeks ago. And it was, you know, and even that there's a lot of, that's a real hot topic right now. And I laid this concept out with that, where a lot of times if people say, I'm just, I, I'm just me, I got to be okay with my body. That message is absolutely correct. But a lot of people are afraid to embrace that message because they feel like, well, if I just say that, then I will, I will let myself go and I will never, you know, yeah. be healthy again. But it's the opposite. It's once I say, no, I'm okay. That's when it's a little bit easier to start to pivot toward a little bit more self-care or yeah. a little, because, because I'm okay. And you're right. It's okay to love myself. And if I love myself, then that actually means I'm going to, I'm just going to be more aware and I'm not going to feel the judgments of others, or I'm going to be able to move those, move past those quickly and do what I feel is right for me based on my values. Yeah. And and this is really obvious to see when dealing with the addicts where they had a slip up and it wasn't just a slip up. In fact, they, they went on a bender for, for three days and then, but to get to point saying, you know what, that's okay. Yeah. You're okay. Rather than, okay, now I'm going to beat myself with this. The fact this happened it leads to more shame, which then leads to more another bender, right? Yeah. You, you listened well in our first episode, That's right. Kurt. I'm learning. Because Johnny. that was the best part where I feel like one of the things I enjoy the most is when the maybe the addict has come back to me the second, third week in a row. And they said, I keep messing up and I haven't read what you wanted me to. And I've done zero mindfulness. Mm-hmm. You know, almost like they are saying that I'll just say, well, all right, I guess go and, and keep doing the addiction. You know, I just, yeah, I just say, yeah. okay, all right. So, uh. What are we going to do today? Yeah. You know, and, and again, taking it back to the leadership context, it's like we may think, man, you know, yeah, I'm not doing as much enough as a bishop. In fact, right. I haven't read my scriptures in three days. And, and that's why this bad thing happened. And so, oh. and then we just keep beating ourselves up for that. So, again, going to a place of saying, I'm good. 
Yeah. That's okay. God's hey, not disappointed in me. Y- this is your fault for this next part. Okay. okay? Let's hear it. When you just said, I maybe haven't read my scriptures in a few days. Again, uh, you've had my office bugged apparently, but <laughs> it, working with a lot of LDS clients, um, and this one is part of acceptance and commitment therapy. If you want to do super deep dive, it's called relational frame theory. And it's amazing. Whoa. I know you see me get all excited. We are the only um, an, you know, species, the animals that relate. We can relate two items within our frame together. If we are an animal, we say that is danger. That is food. That is, you know, safe or those sort of things. We as humans, then we see something like, OK, I haven't read my scriptures in three days and something bad just happened in the ward. And we then try to relate them together. Must be my fault. Yeah. If I was more in tune with the spirit, I would know just like President Monson knew as a bishop that I need to go to the hospital that time. And I would have been there to save him and and bless the family. And this would have. Yeah. Would have been okay. And that's because our brain, bless its squishy pink heart, is trying to, <laughs> to just help us and make sense of things. So it tries to do that to orient ourselves. We, we feel like we need to just make sense of everything when at times I haven't read my scriptures in three days. Noted, you know, it's a value of mine. I'm going to get right back to it. And the more I can do that, the more it's going to become more of a routine and something as bad has happened in my ward. Okay, noted. Now let me turn my presence and attention there and I can go help there. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that the two are necessarily correlated. And one of the things I see often in church culture as well, where this can happen is when people feel like it happens a lot with even in, even financially, where if somebody has, if they haven't done well financially, they must not be righteous, you know, but I mean, there are people that are very righteous that that doesn't mean that they necessarily are, I don't know, living on the top of some mountain or something like that. Right. And so I see that people try to make these correlations often and typically it's for the negative. Right. And on the other side, this is why it can be so dangerous if we turn the gospel into a formula that yeah. if you do these things, exactly. then this will happen. Yes. And even today I heard it, you know, that I know that whenever I read my scriptures before I, I do my homework, I'm my mind's clear and everybody should do that. Right. And that may be the case, Absolutely. but if we apply it as a formula, then we get caught in these traps of thinking, oh, well, that's why it didn't happen. And, and then we get caught in this codependency. Okay. Right? This is so good too. Uh, last one, then I want to get back right no, back to good. where you are. This is so weird. I remember when, uh, you know, I'm a convert and I remember hearing the stories about tithing where it was, I pay it and I get a giant check in the mail, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I haven't got one of those yet. Right. <laughs> I mean, we're like year 29 or something. I keep, all right, when's that big, I don't know if it's publisher's clearing. I don't know what the check is, but right. we always hear those stories. And right? again, they happen. They do. Right. And, I, and I know they happen, mm-hmm. but then I feel like, the hard part is a therapist and is the, when those don't, then people say, well, then I must not be doing something else right, right. then. I, I'm, something must be wrong with me. I used to call, when I taught seminary a lot, I would call these the enzyme moments, which I uh-huh. love the enzyme, yeah. but it was the ones where somebody would come and they would say, Hey, I invited my friend. And uh, he said, no, thanks. Um, and you know, end of story. And he's like, but in the enzyme, they always come and then their family comes and then their dad ends up being a bishop. So did I do something <laughs> wrong? <laughs> Like, no, you didn't. Right. right? right. So, yeah. So that, yeah. that core, we try to, correlate. and again, I love this, this uh, example or this context that we're, we're describing because this is how it begins in our normal experience. It doesn't oh, take, yeah. I was beat as a child and all this happened. Like that's trauma yeah. that needs to be addressed. But these are like just the little bits of trauma that maybe yes. creep up in our life that then puts us in this negative yeah. cycle. Because if your value, and I know we're going to get to this, if your value is connection with people or, and you and you feel like the gospel is in your veins and in your blood. So you are going to preach it because it is something that is, is your value, a sense of being or doing of, you know, of being missionary like, or, or doing service. Then if no one ever joins because of your efforts, it doesn't matter. Right. It's okay. Cause you're living by your values. Right. That's, that's something that doesn't go away day to day. Yeah. Is that our, the next step in our discussion as yeah. far as the personal value? Yeah. yeah, yeah let's get to the values. Yeah. So we've gotten through acceptance. So we, we just need yeah. to practice more personal acceptance. And, well, and, I, okay. and, before, and I'm glad you, okay. you kind of got us back here. So acceptance. And, and I am quoting a little bit out of this book, a liberated mind, which is by Dr. Stephen Hayes, this act book, acceptance and commitment therapy. I do like a couple of concepts. One is he talks about experiential avoidance. And he said, that is the process where which we run from or attempt to control our personal experiences, our thoughts, our our feelings, our sensations to these external events. And so what we often do is we say, I'll deal with that later when I feel better. So we often experiential avoidance, you know, we we Mm. turn to different experiences to avoid these uncomfortable feelings we have. And we tell ourselves in our mind, again, I'll deal with them later. I'll deal with them when things are better, whatever that means. So so what's an example that I'm thinking like? When we kind of feel crummy and we're in this trap where we think, oh, well, I'm just going to well, take what, the night off. Yeah. Or, or right? it's, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to just going to sit down and watch a few episodes of, you know, binge on some show, or I'm going to play video games, or I'm going to just play games on my phone, or it's the old, I'll do it tomorrow story. Uh-huh. And so again, there are times where we may feel overwhelmed or, but to try to start bringing a little bit of awareness to how often do we turn to that? Yeah. I'll do it later story. So, so 
this is the dynamic of, you know, maybe we can beat ourselves up as a, a leader. Maybe a relief society president thinks, oh man, I'm just, I'm totally losing the relief society gig. Like I don't, I, I shouldn't have been called whatever. And, and so I'm going to wait till I get through this before I go serve or do this yes. thing because I want to be on my A game. Yes. I want to be in tune. Yeah. I want to be there. Right. So then we go to the try, try harder gospel. Yeah. And we try and do these things so that we're on our A game when we so do that these then, things. Yeah. When in reality, we just need to accept ourselves and say, you know, I'm just going to act according to the value I have. Yeah. It may not be perfect. So the book I really, before this one just came out, I love this one called The Confidence Gap. And what it's talking about is it's saying there's this gap of saying, I will do whatever it is I'm going to do once I gain the confidence. But in reality, that's a real ambiguous, you know, when I get the confidence to actually get the confidence, you need to do the thing that you're trying to do. So we might say, you know, when I, when I, I don't know, I'll, I'll play the piano someday when I feel like I am just, I'm ready to be more focused. Uh But in reality, the, the act of playing the piano is going to help me with that focus and then help me achieve that goal. Yeah. Because really you're acting, well, I think because you're acting according to the value and yeah. not necessarily to your identity. Yeah. The, or how, you're, how you perceive your identity. You might be wanting to cut this part out. Okay. <laughs> no, this is good. <laughs> right. I think okay. this is but good. But that confidence gap really is that it is. It's the when I feel a certain way, then I will do a, a different thing. Right. But I really need to start working toward that thing, you know, to yeah. feel better. So going back to example, maybe with the release site president, okay. they may say, you know, I'm just, I'm not on my A game. Like, I, haven't even read my scriptures forever. Like I'm not a very good leader. And so I'm going to wait to do that. But instead do you say, well, I'm just going to, I'm just oh, going to move forward. Yes. And in the action of moving yes. forward, suddenly the inspiration comes. Yes. Suddenly yeah, you, yeah, yeah. you go visit the sister just at the right time or right. Yeah. And, and so that action that's is exactly, moving that's forward, much better than mine. Right? Exactly. Because you're acting according to value, Values. not according to identity. And yeah. to me, this is like the crux of our discussion here is that it's so easy to default to identity mm-hmm. when in reality we know our identity is I am a child of God. Yeah. And nothing can change that. Yeah. Right? And that's an, that's very empowering. I mean, if, if, if we all realize that we're little, you know, gods in embryo here walking around, I mean, that's, that's an empowering thought to do, but the adversary is constantly attacking yeah. that identity through these things. Right. Yeah. And so instead you say, okay, I know I'm a, I'm, I know I'm a child of God. I'm not a perfect release site president. And I'm because I'm a child, I'm going to move forward with the values that I have. And through that, this will all work out. Okay, I've got a good one here. Okay, now let's ready, hear it, right? Tony. No, and this is, the, you're right. This is the crux of acceptance and commitment therapy in general. So when we say something like, all right, from this day forward, I am going to be that person that, that is going to serve. I'm going to be the first person at somebody's door with the casserole. There's a mm-hmm. final example. I, I call this the, the Bishop Monson uh, okay. dynamic where we want, we hear these stories about President Monson as a young bishop. He seemed to do everything oh, right, everywhere, right? right? And I guarantee he didn't. But, okay, uh, right? But okay, this is perfect. The perfect way to set this one up. So I'm going to do that. So the cool part is when I say that, and I even feel it right now, your brain literally does give you a little bit of a dopamine rush. Yeah. Like, yeah. But what happens is then we get in that situation and then our brain comes up with, they, they say reason giving, but it's a very nice way to say excuses. So then the next time that happens and all right, I just heard that sister so-and-so fell and she broke her ankle and, and I said, I'm going to go take stuff over. And it sounded good when I said that on Sunday, but it's Tuesday now. And it's like, okay, but I do, I got a big presentation of artwork. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, so, and I also, I, I didn't get a lot of sleep in the morning, you know, this morning. And so, I mean, and so what your brain's trying to do is, is it's trying to hook you onto these stories. It's the, I don't have enough time story or the, I'm really tired story or, and cause if your brain, and here's where people, and I love when people will write me when I do episodes about acceptance and commitment therapy. And they'll say, when you're saying the brain is trying to hook me or fuse me to these stories, they're like, can I just say Satan? And I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. That'd, that'd be great. And, and because, really, cause it is our nature that's doing that. And the natural man is yeah. an enemy to God. And that, so the adversary is always going after the natural man yeah. through our nature. Yeah. Right? And so what your brain is trying to do or what the adversary is trying to, to get you to buy into is this path of least resistance. It's the natural man. It's mm-hmm. the, it's the least amount of work to do. And so if my value now is a value of service or a value of being and doing, and then I, and now I have set and aligned myself that that is what I'm going to do, especially if this is my calling. Then those stories of I have a presentation tomorrow or I didn't get enough sleep last night, we're not even arguing if those are true or false stories. They're true. But are those productive thoughts toward my value-based goal? They're not. So at that point then, I kindly thank my brain for trying to, you know, think of me and try to get me out of the situation. But then I just defuse and I kind of just move back toward being very present and then working toward my value, if that makes sense. Yeah. So going back to the the application of it. Yeah. 
you may be, you want to, you know, you hear that the sister's fallen and maybe she's in the hospital and you think, oh, I need to, I need to go visit her on Sunday and now it's Tuesday. And then mm-hmm. your, your brain starts, you, first you beat up on yourself yep. because you're not accepting yourself. And then your brain says, well, yeah, but tomorrow's a big presentation, yeah. right? Then, and it's, it's already been three days. It's a little right. awkward right now. Yeah, yeah. Right? might as well give it time to breathe. But you're yeah. saying instead, like, go back to your values and say, yeah. I want to be the type of person that is serving, that shows up to the hospital when people yeah, yeah. are in the hospital. Yeah. So I'm going to at least try to go that way or, you know, do something. Yeah, because right? Ian, then you're saying, I'm not even arguing that it's been three days. I'm not even arguing that it's maybe going to be a little awkward. I'm not arguing that I've got a presentation tomorrow. You know, those are all, those could all be true statements, but are they productive thoughts or productive statements toward now my goal, Mm. which is based on my value of serving at this point. And if those aren't in line, then I kindly then diffuse from that thought. I thank my brain for trying to give me those excuses. And then I just go right back to being present. And what's funny is you'll watch, then I'll get in the car and all of a sudden it's like, well, it's a little bit late. You know, your brain's going to keep trying to do it for a little while. Uh And I always say that eventually your brain finally goes, fine, go see him. You know, uh-huh. Uh-huh. and yeah, and just allows you to be very present. But at the same time, because this is where it's sort of dangerous territory, because you then can begin like then you can get your brain can take you to like and if well, but if you don't go see her like, yeah, you're you're a mess. Right. Yeah. And so at times you kind of have to shift back to the acceptance of just saying like, yes. you know, what, I haven't seen her in three days and it may be another three days till I see her. And that's OK. Let me right? I like where you're going with this, too, because I've worked with enough leaders over the years where sometimes I feel like they're telling them these stories of I have to go and say something inspirational or I have to go and be this person that is in complete control. So maybe that's one where leaders at times feel like that goes against their value. If their value is honestly just of being, if their value is of connection or their value is of, of friendship, you know, then I think even as a bishop, if they can then tap into, hey, my value of friendship is I'm just going to go over there, you know, and, and, and my brain might be trying to say, well, you are the bishop. You have to say something very inspirational. Yeah. You know, then it's like, OK, that might be where a bishop will feel like, well, what's wrong with me that yeah. I don't want to go do that because yeah. because I don't necessarily know if I'll have something deep and inspirational to say. Okay, true or false. We're not arguing that. But if your value is of being a good friend, then I turn toward that value and that's going to kind of lead me back there. Does that make sense? So let me take it down this path and see uh, if this works. And uh, are you familiar with Scott Adams, the guy that does Dilbert? Oh, yeah. He has your same barber. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. 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 So so he um, he wrote a book. He writes several books, but one book he wrote called How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Big or something. Mm. And phenomenal, you know, book. I've read it a couple of times now, but he talks about this concept about systems versus goals. So one mm. principle I took away from that that I've applied in my own life is that when it comes to working out, you know, I'm 37 year old man. I mean, things are changing with my body, right? Yeah. I got to, but I, so I got to stay active, right? So one thing he says is he's made a rule for himself that he wants to be the type of person that goes to the gym, not the type of person that loses yes. 20 pounds, right? And so we can set the goal, say, I'm going to lose 20 pounds, right? But instead he says, no, I'm just, I just want to be the type of person that goes to the gym. So he gives himself 100% permission that when he walks in the gym door, he has 100% permission to turn around and go home. Right. And so that's essentially what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. I just want to be the type of person that at least shows up when somebody's going through a hard time. Now I realize I may not get to everybody. Right. And I'm the same way. I don't go to the gym every day and I'm, I accept that. I'm okay with that if I don't, but I want to be the type of person that goes to the gym. And there's been a few times I've literally gone for five, 10 minutes. I go in there and like hit the rowing machine for a minute. I'm just, I'm just not feeling today. In fact, I'm going to go home and okay. that's okay. Right? Yes. And that's, we're oh, in the same vein here. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's funny. Last year, so 2019, I tried to acceptance and commitment therapy just for fun. This uh, goal of doing pushups, a lot of pushups because I have 10 minutes between clients. And so I decided instead of saying, I'm going to do a hundred pushups a day, because I've done that one many, many times. And then when you don't do it a few days in a row, then you feel like, what's wrong with me? I must uh-huh. not be good at this. So I tried to do my value of being fit. That was my value or my value of movement. And so then my goal was just to do pushups each day. And I left it at that. So then it was so much easier to then, you know, if I ended up some days literally doing, I don't know, a set of 20, then my brain would say, well, yeah, but that was only 20. Uh-huh. Right. But then it's like, OK, true. But I'm not even arguing the number. Right. But was that a productive thought toward my value of being fit and my goal of just doing pushups each day? Yeah. And, and it actually took a little longer than I thought. It took a few months of doing this every day to where I did finally feel like my brain just said, fine, do your pushups. And then I felt like it was floodgates unleashed. And then it's, you know, I don't know, doing yeah, way yeah. more than I've ever done in my entire life. And yeah. now it has a year later, it's become quite a habit. And now it's, you know, dug into those deep neuropathways. And, and so I really feel like that is exactly what 
you know, when you accept, then you don't beat yourself up about, you kind of set this value to work, to work from that you are going to do so much more than if you just say, here's this goal. Right. And, and cause then I think often then if we don't meet that goal, then we already have this built in. See, right. What, yeah. See what's wrong with me. I can't do this. Yeah. So is this a good time to kind of transition to that talking more about goals and how that goal yeah. fit into yeah. this? Yeah. So in, in the book, a liberated mind, I'm, and again, I want to read this part cause I, I think when I was reading it to you beforehand, it just, I feel like it, it's is, good. It, yeah. it, it just connects to most people. I almost feel like uh, anybody that I've shared this with. So he talks about values and he says, that values require pivoting from socially compliant goals to chosen values. And what he's saying is people who often attempt to achieve goals because they feel that they have to. And I feel like that is most of us. I mean, I know I've been there so many times in my life that I do. I set a goal because I know that's what I'm supposed to do or Mm -hmm. what somebody's told me I have to do. But he says though, so we try to achieve goals because we feel we have to. Otherwise people we care about or whose views we care about would be displeased or they'll be disappointed in themselves. But research shows that such what he calls socially compliant goals give rise to motivation that is weak and ineffective. So right out of the gate, if you're trying to follow a socially compliant goal because you think that someone will be disappointed in you or that you'll be disappointed in yourself or this is something you're supposed to do, then it gives rise to motivation that's weak and ineffective. So he says we might try to drive our behavior with such external goals, but we also secretly resent them because they undermine our own process of unfolding. So that that one's right. (laughs) It is so good. So let me take this to a context of, of leadership context. And the place, first place my mind goes is to a coordinating council where a group of state presidents get together with a area 70. And this is, this is what happens. And I've talked about this before on the, on the podcast is that they walk in this room and they highly respect this area 70, right? I mean, yeah. they're, he's our leader. I mean, he's our priesthood leader. He's called of God, right? We, we so much respect him, right? And then it talks about the people you respect. Yep. And then he comes at, comes at the coordinating council and says, Hey, here is a, uh, a list of goals and things that are on the brethren's mind. And they're like, oh, well, I respect them too, right? And so you walk out of that meeting with a list of to-dos and you should do's and yeah. everything, right? Yeah. And then you take that back and you try and implement it. And then what happens is now you're the stake president doing the exact same thing to the bishop. And yeah. then he respects you, right? Yeah. And so it's this domino effect to the point where now we have these arbitrary goals that aren't connected to really any value that yeah. you've established as a ward, yes. right? And so you're just sort of spinning your wheels like, I see it right now. And, and I mean, I'm excited for this upcoming conference and this focus we have on the restoration. And President Nelson has asked us to focus on studying the restoration. And now I'm seeing these wards that are sort of like artificially creating this motivation of like, aren't we all excited about the yes. restoration? Because yeah. President Nelson said we should. So let's all be excited, right? And yeah. again, I mean, I love the restoration and right. I have deep testimony of it. But this is how... The trap can manifest itself in an organization and from that leader when we begin to start thinking, well, because again, it goes back to our identity. If we don't focus on this, we're not a very good ward, right? right? Yeah. And so the, the tip and, and focus I, I tell leaders is my gospel according to Kerr, right? <laughs> which you hate that phrase. No, no, I love but, it actually, but I was saying, right, love but, and hate. But this is where I think like when that stake president walks out of that coordinating council, his number one job is to eliminate as much on that list as possible, right? And yeah. create a focus that's attached to the values yeah, of a stake that state. that leader has already established. Oh, that's right? nice. Yeah. Am I, you know, that's so exactly that's, that's yes. Because that like what we were talking about, um, oh, and here, I'll finish the values part. And then you, you're so much what you, you said. So he says, the yearning for self-direction and purpose cannot be fully met by goal achievement since that is always either in the future, meaning I haven't met my goal yet, or the past, meaning I met my goal. So he said, values are chosen qualities of being and doing, such as being a caring parent, being a dependable friend, being socially aware, being loyal, being honest, being courageous. Living in accordance with our values is never finished. It's a lifelong journey, and it provides a way to create enduring sources of motivation based on meaning, and ultimately what your values are is up to you, a matter between you and the person in the mirror. So, or, or if we then throw that as a, a stake, values or ward values, or I think we were talking about, I see it often where somebody says the goal is five baptisms. And again, I'm mm-hmm. just bringing awareness to this. I yes. am not judging, right, right? Right, right? But then when people say, okay, I will do whatever it takes to get that person baptized, period. And then, and this is a man, I mean, you, you do, you do wonderful work here, Kurt. It can be a tiny bit controversial, right? <laughs> As a therapist, I work with a lot of people, a lot of people that are they do get baptized and then they all of a sudden feel like they are a little bit forgotten. And I sometimes call it the shiny new toy theory, you know, where, and so once they are baptized, then they feel a little bit 
like, okay, what, what happened? Everybody was so excited about me and wanted me to come to their home and they wanted to invite me places. And now I'm on my own. Yeah. And so I feel like, you know, bless that ward's heart, whoever it is that those, that kind of award, uh-huh. they got the baptism, but then it's like, okay, so you get five of them. And then does that feel you know, like a, a value based win, or does right. it feel like checkbox? Okay. What's next? Right. So if that, if that ward's value is connection and friendship and inclusiveness, then they are going to live by those values. Those are going to be the value. The goals are going to be based on those values. And so then people that do get baptized are going to feel still more of this connection or more right. of this, Hey, we're, we are all a family and not just a, Hey, I got baptized and what just happened? Oh, this is so rich, Tony. This is oh, so good. I so. I'm, I'm trying to read your face. I'm like, is, is Kurt going like, I'm no. going to write down the mark where I edit this. <laughs> no, this is so good. Let me tell And let me be very clear when you say, you know, sometimes we, I don't know, controversial. I don't know, but I don't know, right? it's, it's sticky stuff, mm. right? So let me be very clear of what we are and what we are not saying. We aren't saying, don't do, don't listen to President Nelson. Don't follow the prophet, know, right? right? Yes. And you're not saying, no. don't do baptismal goals. Don't baptize people. No. What we are saying is that when we become focused on goals rather yeah. than values, yes. that's sort of when the train goes off the track, right? Yeah. So absolutely, let's, let's sit back and ponder over what values are connecting to what President Nelson is asking us. But the problem that a lot of leaders miss is they never take the step to establish what the value of yeah. the ward is, right? It's... Sometimes it's easy to figure that on a personal level, like, yeah, I have a value of, you know, choosing the right and being honest and these things, all right. But as an organization, that leader has to take the time to create a vision that connects to values so that when yeah. President Nielsen says that, you can take it back to the values and say, okay, President Nielsen's asked us to do this. What value does that connect to? Yeah. And if it doesn't connect to a value, and again, values change, yep, you know, in your organization yes. or focuses, then you say, you know what? Well, we're going to listen to conference, but we're not going to create some program just so that we can identify as a ward that just does everything that President Nelson says, right? right. Yeah. Because, and again, it sounds so weird saying that because that's not what we're well, saying. Welcome Anyways, to my world as a right? therapist. And, it could, yeah. Or with the value of the, you know, going back to the missionary baptisms, because a lot of words say, we're going to, this is our focus, this is our goal, right? You get, vo- when you focus on the goal, the value goes out and then you just have the shiny new toy yep. theory, right? Yeah. Or you can become, you say, okay, what values, oh, look, this baptismal goal fits into our value of being a very neighborly ward. Yes. So we're going to create, we're we're gonna gonna create, create something things that. that are based around that value. And then again, 100%, I love goals. I still set goals. Right. And so a goal of having five baptisms is still absolutely fine. If anything, if you're working off of your values, then that will give you a little bit more motivation to even when you are not doing something, when you're bored, when you need to come up with what, what we can do for an activity then we work that toward our values. Yeah. And t- talking about the talks about motivation, what is, how does he say it? Like the faults or the weak motivation? Oh yeah. Yeah. Research shows that such socially compliant goals give rise to motivation that's weak and ineffective. Right. And here we are. I mean, if there's one question that the leading saints audience sends in, it is how do I motivate these people? Like mm-hmm. they won't, I mean, President Nelson said it. Yeah. They should be obsessed about the the restoration because President Nelson said it, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and that, and we wonder why, why is the motivation so weak? Because President Nelson said it, right? Yeah. It is because we haven't attached it to values. Yeah, to our values. And, and I can, I could go on for this too. When I teach this with individuals, I will often say, because I'll have people that'll be going through a midlife, a good old midlife crisis. So either they, they want to change their career, but sometimes they feel like they have, you know, golden handcuffs, they make too much money or they, you know, they're too entrenched or whatever it is. And so I'll say, okay, if you can't then change your career to be something that is in line with your values, then work your values into your career. Mm -hmm. And the simplest example, which is not going to then sound like a, a, a huge one, but I think you'll appreciate it is it was a, it was a teenager home for the summer who was working at a fast food restaurant who his job was man in the grill, you know, Mm -hmm. but he had to have the job. It was a very sad story that led up to that, but he was miserable. So we identified values of adventure, of learning of, and so then he took every chance he could to learn every other part of the restaurant. And then of course, then manager sees him being ambitious and moves him from grill to other more exciting things where he actually then made more money. So there's a guy that then took a situation and worked his value into the situation. Mm -hmm. So you're right. So if you know, we can either point the, the, the values toward the goal, or if we've already got that goal set, let's figure out a way to work some values in there. Yeah. Yeah. And this is phenomenal. And again, we're not poo-pooing on goals or anything. And in my personal life, I've, you know, taken back to a personal context rather than an organizational context. It's easy to, again, I always default to, I'm focusing on systems rather than goals because yeah. I, I don't want to be the person that loses 20 pounds this year. I want to be the person that just maintains a healthy weight and, and eats healthy and do these things, right? So I focus, what systems can I put in place? One of those systems is 
I go to the gym every day. Even though I walk in or walk out, I go to the gym every day. Yeah. And so in a, a ward context or even a bishop, you know, taking back to a personal bishop, relief site, whoever, saying, you know, I may not be the bishop that creates all these back of the enzyme stories, right. but I'm going to be the type of bishop that at least reaches out to, I don't know, I remember as, as a bishop, I would uh, write a personal note once a day. I'd try to do that. Okay. Right? So that that was a system I did. And over time, it it produced the goals that I wanted to see happen. I, so right honestly, now. I love that. As a matter of fact, there's a person in my ward, um, this uh, brother Carlisle, when he was Bishop Carlisle, that guy called everyone on their birthday forever yeah. when he was Bishop after he was a Bishop. And it was, that was his value. And that way, you know, and, and so he was connected with that and it made you feel good. And it made you feel like you wanted to be a better person. And it made you think more about him and it made you want to serve him more. And if he yeah. asked you to do something, you would do it. And so I feel like, yeah, if that's who you are as a Bishop, then that's who you are and, and yeah. start there. Right. Yeah. I liked your one about the losing weight too. I, I work with so many people that they'll set a goal, losing 20 pounds, 30 pounds. They'll starve themselves. They'll get there, you know, goal achieved, but didn't live by any value there or set up a system or mm-hmm. change anything in a necessarily in a healthy way. And then feel the what's wrong with me yeah. kind of feeling. And again, if we are living by values, then we can still hit a goal, but it's going to be a lot more meaningful. Yeah. This is powerful, powerful stuff. <laughs> So what are we missing in this? Um, and, and maybe I want to pivot back to the, um, as far as this, that the nice guy syndrome or the okay. codependency in the typical That's Latter-day right. Saints life is as far as how to see signs that maybe you're trapped in that, because a lot of people may be listening to that, like, huh, it's interesting that other people have this issue because I don't, I never feel bad for myself and I'm doing a pretty good job and I'm, I've accepted myself. Right. But to me, there's certain red flags that I see from time to time that are, that scream at me in some groups that, you know, I'm not literally screaming at me, but I'm just, it is just so overly obvious when we have the, the leader who maybe it's the Relief Society president who just wants, they want to project a feeling onto these people. So it projects back on them. So they're overly nice. They just want that someone walks in there and they want that person to feel something. Yes. We want them to feel that this Relief Society is so loved. Now, if we stop there, that seems like, well, yeah, of course. But the problem is, is that we subconsciously say, well, because if they feel loved, then that defines me as something I'm a good leader. And yeah. so I'm going to overcompensate it again and again. So it's just that feeling of, are you being like, you've kept yourself being an overly nice guy. Are yeah. you ap- apologizing a lot? Are you, you know, just being, a, trying to be a Superman in every context, not showing your weaknesses, right? That's, I mean, okay, vulnerabilities. Go. Yeah. yeah. Take us there. Well, no, I mean, that one's a big one too. And as a matter of fact, I just pulled up, you can see right here. You, know, you tease me about not highlighting things. Hey, so I'm showing, I do. Job. This is one thing highlighted. <laughs> there's a, there's a couple of definitions of happiness and I love talking about this whenever I get a chance. And I think it will apply to this um, being vulnerable or being authentic. So uh, we talk about happiness and this is from a book called the happiness trap, which is also another acceptance and commitment therapy book. But it says the word happiness has two very different meanings. The common meaning of the word is feeling good. In other words, feeling a sense of pleasure, gladness, or gratification. We all enjoy these feelings, so it's no surprise that we chase them. So I even think in this context, a lot of times maybe as that bishop, they just want to feel good. They want the member to feel good. They want to feel good. And of course, we're going to chase after those feelings in whatever way we can. They say, though, however, like all human emotions, feelings of happiness don't always last. No matter how hard we try to hold on to them, they slip away every time. And as we shall see, a life spent in pursuit of just those good feelings is, in the long term, deeply unsatisfying. In fact, the harder we chase after pleasurable feelings, the more we are likely to suffer from anxiety and depression. Because if we're constant, because we're doing that experiential avoidance, we're just trying to go after whatever it will be that will just make us happy in that moment or mm-hmm. make that other person happy in that moment. Mm-hmm. He says the other far less common meaning of happiness is living a rich, full, and meaningful life. When we take action on the things that truly matter deep in our hearts, when we move in directions that we consider valuable and worthy, clarify what we stand for in life and act accordingly, then our lives become rich and full of meaning and they, we experience this powerful sense of vitality. And this is not some fleeting feeling. It's a profound sense of a, of a life well lived. And although such a life will undoubtedly give us many pleasurable feelings, it will also be give us uncomfortable ones such as sadness, fear, and anger. This is only to be expected. If we live a full life, we'll live a full range of human emotions. And I think President Hinckley has an amazing quote that talks about the, you know, your putts won't drop, your steak might be tough or that sort of thing, but, you know, enjoy the ride. And I think about that whenever I think about this less common meaning of happiness. And maybe in that sense, a bishop might be experiencing a member that is going through something really hard. And that's where they, they don't feel like they know what to do because it makes them feel a bit uncomfortable. So that they tap into that, that maybe a, a value of just, I don't know, connection or being there, just, you know, they can go and be present and be there when somebody is having these uncomfortable feelings, such as sadness or fear or anger, and they don't have to just 
chase after that. No, we're, we're good. Right. This feels yeah. good. We're, are you happy? Yeah. You know, I don't know if that right. kind of, yeah, exactly. And I, cause my heart goes out to those leaders who, and here's another maybe indication that you're experiencing some codependency and, and the nice guy syndrome is that are you avoiding people yeah. in your work? Right. And it breaks my heart. I think of my good friend who experiences same gender attraction. Mm-hmm. He came out, he was open and the Bishop bless his heart did not, he didn't know how to help him. Yeah. Right. He didn't know what to say. He didn't, yeah. there's no script. I mean, these are such complicated situations. And so my friend just felt like the Bishop completely avoided him. Oh, just, you yeah. know, walked the other way down the hall. And, and again, and bless his heart. There's nobody's fault, but this is, if you are finding that you're avoiding people, there's yeah. something that I can't, I can't fix the situation. And that's how I, yep, I can't I make feel them good feel, about myself. Yes, exactly. Is, I can't make them feel good. That doesn't make me feel good. I don't know what to do. And that we talked earlier, that brings up this experiential avoidance. I'm going to go disappear into something else yeah. because I don't want to be, I don't want to sit with these feelings, yeah. these uncomfortable feelings. But these people over here, I, I feel like I make yes, a difference. I can right? make them feel good yeah. and that will make me feel good. Right. Yeah. And this is another in the nice guy, or the no more Mr. Nice Guy with uh, Robert Glover. He talks about this, that nice guys often find projects to be in relationships yeah. with because, you know, they may find the abused girl who had a rough childhood and now he's going to be a great husband. Right. Yeah. And so we sometimes do this in the church where we may find the member who's less active and then we hyper focus on them. Like mm-hmm. we're, you know, I'm going to bring this person, I'm going to will this person back to the church and back to a, a gospel, the covenant path, because I'm going to be, I'm going to love them and I'm going to be there for them. I'm going to serve them. Cause right? I know how to do that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I know how to do that. And, and yeah. by, by living in that world now my, I'm okay with my identity. Cause look, look what I'm doing. Look who I'm helping. Right. Yeah. And again, we need to help people. We, we need to serve. And this is sort of the conflict that can come from discussions like this is like, yeah, we need to serve that person. But when we begin to serve to a point where we are identifying by what that progress is making there. Right. And we, yeah. you know, if we want to be the Bishop who's at the MTC, you know, what, taking the picture with that young man, because you helped him and you got him there. And, and those are beautiful experiences, are. but we have to stop and say, am I identifying myself? Am I of worth my level of effectiveness as a leader because of this person's progress. Right. And not the, my sense of unfolding, as I said earlier. Yeah. yeah, I love that. Yeah. And just being okay with that, that unfolding, no matter how it unfolds, like I'm developing as a person and I'm okay with that. Yeah. So you would ask them, yeah. So the acceptance, the authentic, uh, you know, the buzzwords in therapy that I use all the time Uh are truly are about being authentic, being raw, being vulnerable. But you can see now where this is why I love this kind of work, acceptance and commitment therapy, because at the, at the end of the day, there comes that cliche, but the, once you recognize I'm okay, once you realize that I'm going to have my own set of values, I, you know, we didn't tap into that and I'll be so quick with that, but that's that when I work with people individually, I have this list of values and they all sound amazing. And so it's difficult for somebody to sit there with a list of 50 or 60 values. And then for me to say, tell me which ones of these maybe feel more real to you or are more um, in line with what you believe than others. And uh-huh. Because it's difficult because, and I think I shared off mic with you, the one I like to talk about is honesty. If you're sitting with a, your partner and you say, is, is honesty important? I mean, who's going to say no, right? right? Yeah. But when I'm working one-on-one with people, if somebody grew up in a home, and I've had this happen many times where they had two maybe emotionally abusive or, or you know narcissistic parents who never told the truth and kept this person just constantly in this state of, I don't even know what to believe. I don't know what to tell my friends. I don't know. I, mean, I could tell you stories about that for days, yeah. but that person is then going to say, no, you know what? Absolute honesty is a value that I, I must have in my life. But I also have people that grow up in homes where there was brutal honesty. You know, you don't look good in those jeans. You are overweight. That didn't sound very good. You know, uh-huh. I don't like that uh, paper you just wrote. I mean, there are people that then come out of those situations and again, their own experiences. Then they say, no, my, my core value is going to be compassion or kindness. And so I'm not, I don't have to be that brutally honest person. Okay. So t- take me through this exercise you do with, yeah. so you bring out a list of values that are generally, you know, general values that wouldn't surprise us. Honesty. Um, yeah. There's a, yeah. Of, and they all have like a little, they all have a little piece to them that says, Hey, here's a, here's a definition that goes along with the value. And I'll ask the person, Hey, I'm going to read this value. And so I'm, I'm showing Kurt okay, right here. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. So one's like acceptance. It says to be open to and accepting of myself, others, life, etc. You know, so acceptance. So for some, that's going to mean something. And usually I'll say, Hey, tell me what that means to you. And some people might say, you know, that one doesn't really mean a lot to me. Acceptance. You know, I feel like I'm very accepting of others. Or somebody might say, you know what? I have a hard time being accepting of things that I don't really know a lot about. Uh-huh. So that's for so, them. That's so what's okay. the, what's the 
point of doing this exercise, like pointing yeah. out the value? Where so, are you guiding? So them you to? find you narrow things down to about yeah, usually it's about four or five really core values that then those that is how you direct your life. So at that uh-huh. point, then if you then come up upon one of these situations, let's say as a bishop again, and you feel like I don't quite know what to do, then I'm going to have people tap into one of these values that we've identified that is unique and core yeah. to them. And then what's a, an action that they can do based on this value. And I think I'm glad. Yeah. yeah, maybe this one would have been, I should have said this one earlier. So when we talk about going to the hospital again, if I come into the value of compassion or connection or, you know, one of those, or even some people really identify with the value of fun. You know, if I can go to the, if I, it's like, I don't know what to say or do in, in that situation, but I have this value of fun, then I'm going to, I'm going to go get like, I don't know. Uh, there's that movie back in the eighties with Ron Williams, Patch Adams or something. Uh-huh. I'm going to yeah, put yeah. a clown nose on and a wig and I'm going to go in there gotcha. and uh-huh. I'm going to, bring my value of fun in there. Yeah. You know, so with this exercise, you're trying to pinpoint like, what are the values that really anchor them? Yeah. In their yes. human experience. Yes. Because this goes back to a little bit of, and this is what leads into that feeling like authentic or feeling like knowing who you are because we, and this is no one, no one's doing this maliciously, but we grow up and our, our parents are projecting values onto us. You should feel this way. Uh-huh. You should believe this. This should be important. And, to and you. a religious experience can do that as well. Yeah, and again, I, I, not that we shouldn't do no, that. It's absolutely. But. Yeah. So, and that's that part where I feel like, and, uh, I, and I know you've had people that have talked, you know, stages of faith, things like that uh-huh. on the, which I absolutely love. I work yeah. with that almost every day in my practice. But that's where when, yeah, sometimes in, you know, they call it what an all encompassing belief system, it's even including here are your values. And so, and again, meant in a very good, positive way, but based on people's experiences that they've had, something might kind of be difficult for them with one or some of those values that they're saying that they've been told this should be important to you. Yeah. Well, if all of a sudden it's not now they start doing the what's wrong with me story in their right. brain. So with this exercise, like yeah. what if you do, okay, you find four values, but yeah. maybe uh, compassion isn't on that list of four. And, yeah. and as a bishop, I think, no, I, bishops are supposed to be compassionate. Right. Like, exactly. so no, good. How, how do you balance that without, uh, you know, them going towards the shame trap. So, I mean, in that will, what you just said is the key it's saying, because when, when we talk about compassion, when we go over a value list of compassion, I'll say, Hey, tell me what compassion means to you. And, you know, and, and that person has grown up with their own, what they call private experiences. They might've uh-huh. been in a home where they watched a compassionate mother, maybe be emotionally abused by a, a, a very unkind father, or they might've seen compassion not go well for people, or they might've seen, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So then, so then to them again, and that's a great example of their private experiences is that is going to mean something different. So when somebody says you should feel compassion, you know, no one understands exactly what that person hears through their lens yeah. and what compassion means to them. So just like when somebody hears you know, there's one that I get that I run into a lot in the church, which is uh, conformity is a value. It says to be respectful and obedient of rules and obligations. So there are some people that immediately say, oh, I'm a rule follower. Yeah, that's that is a very, very big value for me. And you can imagine there are other people that say, man, that is the furthest from a value for me is uh-huh. con- to tell me to conform and to, you know, just follow rules blindly. And so if you have somebody that that doesn't necessarily feel like a core value to them, and now you're telling them, no, you need to do this just because it's what you need to do. You can already see that they're going to say, man, okay, something must be wrong with me then. Cause I don't feel like I can do that. Yeah. And, and we need to be aware of that right? Yes. because I just think of, you know, you may be in a meeting, especially this year as we, we study the book of Mormon, someone may st- stand up and say, I just absolutely love the book of Mormon. Like every day of my life, I open it up and it's just, yes. it just guides me and directs me. And, and again, I, <laughs> it's scripture. I believe it. It's great. I, I love it. Right. Yeah. But someone may think like, oh, I don't, I mean, the book of Mormon is great. I mean, I read it and there's great scriptures, but it doesn't resonate like that. Like, so she has a value yes. that I should have. Yes. Oh, so I actually, there's an episode I, and I don't remember many na- numbers of episodes I do, but this one I do <laughs> yeah. refer to often. It's uh 125 and it's for working with people that are kind of on a faith journey, we'll call it. Uh-huh. And not only do I talk about stages of faith, but I talk about those transcendentals, truth, beauty, and goodness. I don't know if you ever kind of heard this put in this uh-huh. context. Yeah. So there are people that truth, truth, it might represent the doctrine in the scriptures. And that is what is their foundation. Beauty can often represent the talks from the apostles or music or nature. And that might be where they feel really anchored in the gospel or the goodness I've heard at times represents the people. You know, they like, they're the ones that do want to actually go out there and move people around on a Saturday or, or that sort of thing. 
And I, I love that concept because even as a seminary teacher for seven years, I used to pull the convert card and just say, okay, it must be because I'm a convert, but I don't remember anything I read. So I would seven years in the scriptures and I would sit there in a gospel doctrine class and somebody would say, well, brother Overbay, uh, tell us that obscure uh, story from the old Testament, you know, cause you've been a seminary teacher. And I was like, I have no idea, but uh-huh. I went through a long period of time where I wasn't about to admit that. And I really did feel shame and I felt uh-huh. bad to the point where at times I didn't want to go to gospel doctrine. Yeah. And, and it took that acceptance or vulnerability for me to finally say, Oh, I'm okay. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I love reading scriptures. I love teaching the scriptures, but I don't remember them very well. Yeah. And, and guess what? I'm okay with that, you yeah. know, but I really enjoy that. Uh, the beauty part. I love inspirational messages, conference talks. I can come to tears in a hymn. Uh-huh. You know, I love nature. That's why I love uh, ultra running and trail running. So that to me resonates. Right. And then the goodness, eh, sometimes people bug me, you know, yeah. <laughs> but, but so I don't know if that kind of speaks to it too. Yeah. And so, and, and even when I do, sometimes I do firesides on this concept, truth, beauty, and goodness. And the hard part is the truth people, the people that maybe their values are more in line with the doctrine. A lot of times then they hear that and, and I'll have people in the audience almost like in tears saying, okay, so I'm, I'm okay that I, that, you know, scripture study can be hard for me, but I love conference talks or I love, you know, social events with the church. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so, and people will hear that and they'll say, okay, so I'm okay. But I will feel like the, the truth people will say, well, actually they just need to read their scriptures more. Then they'll understand. Right. right? And that's this important concept and dynamic we face in, in leadership is that if, again, if we prescribe a behavior yeah. that is attached to one of our values to fix something in their life, that's not attached to their values, then we miss it. And yeah. that's where we can lean down the wrong, wrong path. I, I st- and this is, I love this because this is the part where, there are going to be people that are going to be then more in line or they're, they're the people that really enjoy this, the doctrine, the truth, the scriptural part that then are going to hear what I'm going to say next. And they're going to say, I can't believe he said that. And there's going to be other people that are going to identify with it. And it goes back to the acceptance part. I remember when I was honest to goodness, going through and understanding my ADD diagnosis uh-huh. as an adult. I mean, I hid this thing forever. And then I remember, oh my gosh, this makes so much sense that when I would have to sit down or my goal was to sit down and read scriptures linearly for 15 minutes. I mean, I did not come out of that feeling like yeah. I'm the man, you know, right. my brain would go everywhere. I mean, it would just, and then I would, but I would try to just slog through it. And then there were days where I just wouldn't want to do it. And then I would feel like this isn't something must be wrong with me. And I'm not about to start telling people that I have a real struggle with just sitting for 15 minutes. And then all of a sudden I realized, wait, except that I'm okay. Like I'm, I'm, I'm human. I've got all the experiences that I bring to the table. I can't just blame it on being a convert. Yeah. And then I realized that, you know, all right, this is more of my brain. When I start reading something just goes crazy goes to town and I, and I remember the first time that i said i'm reading some new testament stuff and i thought what do they wear like what are they what kind of sandals are they you know yeah. and so all of a sudden i'm 15 minutes on google and i have read <laughs> so much about old or new testament footwear and i was like that's the coolest stuff ever so yeah. now guess what i want to do i want to go read the scriptures again I mean, it wasn't exactly right, right. and then i went on to be a bishop and a stake president <laughs> but i mean i went back in there i'm like okay this is good it's still in front of you Tony. It's no 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 happen. how dare you so but, but so that's <laughs> the part where i feel like from this day forward I'm okay. My goal now right. is is spiritual study. You know, right. my value is curiosity. Yeah. And so I'm going to try to sit down and read that. And if my mind wants to go check some things out, I'm yeah. going to go on that little journey. Right. And then I'm, so then I end that by saying nothing's wrong with me. And oh my gosh, I just spent actually more time thinking of spiritual things than I did before. And I don't have the something's wrong with me or I'm broken at the end of it. Right. And it's like this dance between values and identity, right? Yeah. Like, because on the flip side, the adversary can use that as like, oh, you're failing this value. You should identify like this and back and forth. And our father in heaven is doing the same thing. Like, you know, you're, you're my child. Like, and here's some values. Oh, that's the value you're focused on. Oh, great. You know, run with it and come back and see how that you can identify with that value. And and you see how I love you more because of that value. So it's like this dance back and forth. But Again, we can say, well, I'm just going to focus on my identity. Yeah, but the adversary can take you down a negative Absolutely. path. Absolutely. And this is why I love, honestly, I love one of the few things I do remember is uh, DNC 46 and the idea of our spiritual gifts or mm-hmm. the parable of the talents. Or, mm-hmm. And I love the spiritual gifts one now because that I feel like is the ultimate form of acceptance. I mean, I've been given certain gifts based on whether it was the situations that I'm going to come to earth and deal with or it's the situations that I'm here dealing with. And so it's okay that I don't have the gift of tongues or it's okay that I don't have a mind that is quick to something smart you know yeah. but if uh, if it's more of a, uh, a gift of empathy or a gift of compassion or then that's okay and that's where we start from that's where we operate from right yeah so powerful so let me pivot back to his uh, uh, maybe we'll wrap up at some point tony like, <laughs> I maybe. Know, right? what time is my know. fireside tonight who yeah. knows who knows so just far as like another thing is if you have a hard time saying no to yeah. people 
that's maybe something to sit with and, and ponder over because you're you want to identify as a person that always says yes and, and then you begin to identify negatively with that. You avoid conflict that yeah. we talked about avoiding and then not being vulnerable, trying to be that, you know, the perfect bishop on, hard. on the surface. Yeah. It's really hard, especially in our culture, right? And so that's why I, I, I'm trying to create content that emphasizes more about this concept of, of vulnerability yeah. and just standing in front of those you lead and being vulnerable and saying, let me tell you why this week was awful. And brother, what what do you got? You know, and, and again, not just to create this negative energy, but yeah. when we share part of our soul, we connect with people. Absolutely. And connection, at the end of the day, we want our organizations, we want to be a leader that's high in values, mm. high in connection. I don't think any leader would say, I don't want that. Right. right. Yeah. And so by to get there, that that's where we have to face some of these, you know, the, these concepts we're doing as far as our values, why we're doing it. Are we accepting when we're, we're falling short, those types of things? Cause this is going to stimulate an organization that's high on values and high on connection. There's probably more there that, that there's a ton. And it. I, and I'm sure you've seen this with your podcast. I never anticipated that, when I would be vulnerable in an episode that, that, that would always bring more feedback. Mm -hmm. You know, it took me 150 episodes to do a two part on my ADHD diagnosis. Cause I, there was a part of me that didn't want to put that out there for yeah. whatever reason I would allude to it. And I started getting people that would email me and say, when you say my ADD moment or my whatever, are you joking? Or do you really have this? Is uh -huh. this a diagnosis? And so finally I went big with it and a surprise, you know, that's those episodes have thousands of more downloads than other episodes. Yeah. And I, I have lost track of the emails that come in and say, Hey, I finally went and got a diagnosis or I finally went in and did something about it. Or I, you know, and this is because, you know, one, this is not what you're asking. I know, but you're not, you know, undiagnosed uh, ADD often looks a lot like depression where people feel like, again, it goes back to this, what's wrong with me. So, and I want to address one thing too. You talked about when people say no, I feel like when people do become more accepting and they feel like this maybe isn't something that they can throw a value into, or maybe that's not the best way to put it. But I feel like that is now where we can delegate because there are going to be people, the eldest quorum president, relief society president, where there are going to be people that that is their passion, their value. And so right. why not be open and vulnerable as a leader and say, man, thank you so much for coming in. And I appreciate this. And I'm so grateful. And here's my vulnerability is yeah. I don't know what to do with this, but you know, I'm wondering if we can get sister so-and-so involved or whatever. And now we're, again, we're creating this uh, kind of this unity or, or community. Yeah. And now we're going to leverage someone else's value yeah. and my authenticity and everybody wins. Yeah. And go, going to the larger concept of delegation. I mean, this is like the, you know, jargon of, of leadership. You should yeah. delegate more, right? right? But to delegate the values that maybe you don't possess. And it takes me, my mind goes to the experience of when I served in a state presidency. I was the first counselor. The second counselor was Brad Randall. Shout out to Brad. <laughs> and he, and we were, we were literally two months apart in age, like same age and just, and he's one of my best friends. I mean, he's, he's awesome. But he would go, as we'd go visit different wards, he could go to a different ward in a stake and he would like know everybody's name and like connect with oh, them. And, yeah. but hey, Joe, how are you? You know, how's your job doing? And I would look at him like, why aren't I that guy? Yes. Right. Yeah. And so I finally just got to a point of saying, you know what? It's just not me. Yeah. I don't, I'm not that guy, you yeah. know, and I'm nice. I, I connect with people when I can, but I'm not going to remember your name in every detail, but he just has a knack for it. And that's Absolutely. his values. And I'm okay with that. Right. Yep. Yep. And so in leadership, just being okay that, you know, I would love to be elder Holland. I'm not right. And that's okay. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's funny when you say this, when I was a new therapist, people would often say, I don't even know if I believe in therapy. I don't know if I need therapy. I used to say, oh, okay, but here's this evidence and this data and this whatever and whatever. And, and, you know, later on I felt like, okay, I'm, I'm authentic. I'm more comfortable in my, in my own skin and my own brain. And if people would say that now, I would say, okay, well, bless your heart. You know, well, if you ever need anything, you let me know. And I feel like, okay, I'm okay. I mean, it's again, that acceptance of, I don't have to, that those insecurities or I don't have to say, but I want you to like me. So I need to convince you that my, my job and my value is worth something so that, you know, I'll feel better because you feel better. Uh -huh. And and that's right. We don't need to do that. Yeah. And that's sure. part of that being authentic. And as I sit here and think, and I'm, I'm, I'm putting, I'm going back and forth to different contexts to, you know, my church calling to being a husband and being a father. And I'm just thinking like, man, I, I just got kind of a mess of things. And yeah. this is a messy, you know, model. I mean, as far as going through this and I make mistakes and yeah, sometimes I do identify too much. And, you know, I think, I go around to these firesides and sometimes I do a fireside and it's great. And, and, but I can, I kind of am ashamed that I sort of like people coming up to me and say, no, you did a great job. Which right. It's okay. Right? Yeah. And, it, and, <laughs> right. and it's okay. But you sort of, that's the mess of things. Uh, and I want to be the leader that, you know, like you said, that has the right scripture that comes in and people leave the office on fire and, and just loving life. But at the end of the day, this is, I think the, 
a great message to sort of wrap up with is that we get to a point that we can't be someone we're not. Mm -hmm. We have to identify with certain values and and lead according to those values the best we can. But at the end of the day, we're not going to solve it for them, but Christ will. So this is like, this message motivates me to take people to the feet of the Savior and say, I can't fix them. Will you fix them? And he can. And Okay. And I would say, if you step on my atonement speech, Kurt, I will walk <laughs> out of Tony. this room, right? Go for it. But I mean, this is the thing that acceptance and commitment therapy, this whole shift, when I talked about that six, seven years ago, when mm-hmm. I was trained in this concept, I don't know what happened. The skies opened, you know, everything came, became clear. <laughs> and it really did feel like I get, I just love the atonement because the atonement is you're just trying your best. And, you know, you go back to this, the, as Brad Wilcox, it's like Christ doesn't make up the difference. He is the difference. Yeah. Because again, we're, you're the only person on the earth that has your private experiences, all that nature, nurture, birth, order, abandonment, rejection, DNA, that you're it. So nobody understands you except for guess who? Yeah. It's the savior right. period. Right. And, and I've got some great quotes ready to go for my fireside tonight that, you know, where elder Bednar, there's a couple others that talk about, that the atonement doesn't just cover sin. It covers sorrow. It covers loneliness. It covers heartache. It covers, it covers it all because those are all of those things that we're, since we're trying, where these imperfect beings have all of this just stuff, these private experiences we bring to every situation and we're trying to be vulnerable or, or, or we're afraid to, we're, you know, mm-hmm. we're just trying our best. And so that's where I feel like, again, the atonement, it hits it all. And I always say, let me interject. Yeah, yeah. When I look at that value, that list of values, and I think, I only pick four, but I want to be all of those. You cannot be all of no, those, but no. the Savior can yes, be all of those. exactly. Things. It makes all those up. So then I always say when you get to that final, you know, you're there, you you pearly gates, and they're about to issue your harp and all this stuff, and then you see the Savior, I feel like a lot of us feel like we're, we're going to say, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. And I feel like he is going to run up to us and grab us and do one of these and just say, no, you did amazing. You you, mm-hmm. you did Okay. You made me cry last time. Um, you, <laughs> you got Kleenex. Okay. <laughs> yes, you do. Uh, bless your heart. But it's like, you know, you did all you could. I, I got you. Like, I, you're good. Like, thank you for working so hard. You know, thank you for trying your best. And, and, I, and I know that was messy. The agency, you know, uh-huh. thought it sounded like a good idea. I'm totally kidding. It was a great idea, but it's like, but, but that's why I've got you. That's where the atonement comes into play. Cause I really do feel like it's all about our private experiences and we do have our agency and we're trying our best. And so in the end, I'm sorry, but yeah, it's the atonement wins. And that's such an incredible feeling because I think that helps us continue to say, okay, I'm okay. And just keep trying. That concludes my interview with Tony Overbay. Man, that was good. I I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. (laughs) I don't know. Maybe, maybe you all hate it. I don't know. That's fine. I benefited from it and I, uh, I learned so much. I actually went to Tony's fireside later that night and he uh, hit the ball out of the park. It was awesome. Just his perspective, the way he says things, the way he thinks about things is so helpful. And uh, this will not, I guarantee you, this will not be the last interview that I have with Tony Overbay on on the Leading Saints podcast. But be sure to check him out at uh, the Virtual Couch podcast. You can, uh, whatever app or system you're using to listen to this episode, Just go to the search bar, type in virtual couch, and you'll find Tony and the good work he does there. So I would love to know your feedback on this. What angle are we not covering? What should we consider? And is there anybody else that we should consider interviewing that's going to help leaders be better prepared to lead, especially those topics that are kind of invisible, like this one. The codependency is quite invisible. It can be easy to just miss it and think, uh, no, you know, we're, uh, there's no problem here, but actually there there is, and we need to consider it, and uh, whether we fix it or not, at least we know it's there. So go to leadingsaints.org slash contact, and there you can send me a message and uh, give me your thoughts. And remember, text the word LEAD to 474747 and join the Core Leader community today. It came as a result of the position of leadership which was imposed upon us by the God of heaven who brought forth a restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when the declaration was made concerning the own and only true and living church upon the face of the earth, we were immediately put in a position of loneliness, the loneliness of leadership from which we cannot shrink nor run away, and to which we must face up with boldness and courage and ability.